Hi everybody. Um, as Elizabeth said, I'm Jen Young. Um, I'm going to give you an introduction to radio pharmacy today. Um, so here you can see some pictures of the radio pharmacy. Um, and this is where radio traces are made using aseptic manufacture, uh, which basically means you're trying to ensure that all the products that we're making are sterile. Um, a radio pharmacy is normally within the hospital um, and the manufacturing unit has to have lots of controls in place to ensure that everything's sterile. Um, as you can see here, um, we have specific sterile isolators um, that have gloves or gauntlets at the front. Um, and it's in these isolators that the radio traces are made. All staff within the production unit have to gown up um, and they also have to cover their hands and their hair. Um, and there's very strict cleaning protocols throughout. So um, staff working in radio pharmacies, and in fact, staff working in pet centres like Maite described as well, um, tend to be split into three teams. Um, the production team who manufacture the radio tracer, the quality control team who conduct tests on the radio tracer to ensure it meets specifications, and the quality assurance team who check all of the documentation and are the final people that release the radio tracer for use. Um, these three teams must be independent from each other. This is part of the GMP requirements and it helps to ensure quality. Um, something slightly different has to happen if the radio tracer is an investigational medicinal product for use within a clinical trial. Um, in this instance, it must be a qualified person or um, QP that carries out that release. These people have additional training and certification compared to other members of the QA team, and they have to be named on the IMP license for the radio pharmacy or for the pet centre. Um, so it's really important that you have this person available if you're doing a clinical trial. So um, in what way is um, radio pharmacy production different to um, the type of uh, radio traces that Maite talk about, um, which are made at units that have a cyclotron. Well, radio pharmaceuticals that are typically made in the radio pharmacy focus um, uniquely on radioactive metals. Um, and because these are metals rather than non-metals, they require a different type of chemistry in order to form radio traces. Um, metals can easily be incorporated into compounds using specially designed molecules called chelators. Um, the word chelator is derived from the Greek for claw, and we can imagine um, that there are a number of claws holding the metal in place. In radio traces, lots of these claws are joined together so that they totally surround the radioactive metal and bind it really tightly so that it's stable when it's been injected into a patient and it gets to the disease site. So how are radio traces designed? So radio traces can be made up of just this chelator uh, with the radio metal going into the center, or they can be a bit more complex. Um, you can also have a situation where you have the chelator, which is then attached to a linker which is then attached to a targeting molecule. So then when you add the radioactive metal, um, this will then um, specifically go to a disease cell, which may express a certain type of uh, protein or uh, targeting um, species on its surface. So in order to understand how radio minerals are generated within a radio pharmacy, um, this, I wanted you to introduce you to the concept of a decay scheme, um, where one radioactive isotope called the mother decays into a second called the daughter, which then decays into a stable element. Um, I want to talk you through this process because it's slightly different to what Maite talked about with the cyclotrons um, and it forms the basis of how um, radio metals are generated within uh, a radio pharmacy. So in this scheme we're really most interested in the daughter isotope. Um, so this is the one in the middle of this scheme uh, as this is the isotope that's going to be used for imaging. It's the one that's incorporated into the radio tracer 
Um, it's got a short radioactive half-life, uh, which minimizes the dose to the patient. The mother isotope is the one that's going to produce that daughter isotope we're interested in. Um, and this one needs to have a longer radioactive half-life on the um, scale of weeks, and it must be easily separated from the daughter. And then lastly, we have the stable isotope that is no longer radioactive. So um, here are the decay schemes for the most common radioisotopes used within radiopharmacy. So these are both radio metals, um, and they are technetium 99M used for SPECT imaging. Uh, and this is its decay scheme. And you can see the one we're interested in is the one in the center. Um, and gallium 68, which is used for PET imaging, but it's um, produced in radio pharmacies. Again, it's, this, um, it's the daughter uh, isotope that we're most interested in. This is used for PET CT. So um, the source of the radio isotopes within a radio pharmacy is a generator which is a pretty simple piece of equipment. Um, you have a column on which you load the mother isotope. Then over time, the mother isotope will decay into the daughter. So you can see the red turning to the green here. Um, and this is the isotope that you want and you want to be able to separate. Um, so in order to separate this, you flush the column with a solution, which removes just the daughter isotope. And this solution or generator eluate, so we call it generator eluate, is what is used to manufacture the radio tracer. Um, this generator can stay in the radio pharmacy for many days, uh, and you basically elute the generator when you need to make the radio tracer. So you basically have this daughter isotope on demand. So unlike a cyclotron, these are much smaller pieces of equipment. Here are some examples of a technetium 99M generator and a gallium 68 generator. They're about the size of a shoebox, uh, but they're really heavy as they're shielded with lead. Um, the technetium 99M generator has um, a 21 day shelf life. Um, so you can keep it in the radio pharmacy and use it to make technetium 99M over that period of time. And the gallium 68 generator has a one year shelf life. Um, and this difference is basically due to the properties of the mother isotope. The mother isotope for gallium-68 has a much longer half-life. Um, so that's where those differences come from. So um, how do we use it within the radio pharmacy? Well, the generator sits in a specific drawer within this sterile isolator, um, and it can be eluted, as I'm going to show you in the next video. Oh, here's the, here's the drawer. <laughs> So you open up the hatch to access the generator. Uh, you take off a cap to, re to reveal a needle. Um, and then you take a shielded evacuated vial, um, which is in that silver metal thing there, and you put it on top of the generator. The needle that was on top of the generator pierces the vial and the vacuum inside the vial pulls that liquid from the generator into the vial. And then it's ready to use. So um, the generator eluent um, is then added to a kit to form the radio tracer. These can be single vial, two vial or multi-vial kits as seen here. Um, but basically these kits contain everything that's needed for the radio labeling. It contains the chelator that's gonna bind that radioactive metal and target it to the site of disease, plus um, other ingredients such as buffers, filler, uh, antioxidants, reducing agents, bactericides, things like that. So the kind of process that um, you'd go through in order to make a radio tracer in a radio pharmacy um, is shown here. So this example is specifically for how you would make gallium-68 dotatate, which is um, used to image neuroendocrine tumours and is made in a, a lot of radio pharmacies across the UK. Um, so basically, you take four mils of water for injection, you add it to this kit, uh, dissolve up all of the solids that's in there. Um, you then add a small amount of buffer, and you draw up that solution into a 10 mil syringe. Um, you then elute the generator, and then add the contents of the syringe that you had to that eluate from the generator. You then heat it up in a heating block, and then it's ready. Um, 
to be used um, after it's been QC'd. So you remove a QC sample. So it's really important to work quickly and efficiently to produce radio traces to ensure that there's enough radioactivity left for the patient. As soon as you elute the generator, the radioactive isotope starts decaying. And so as Maite explained, the number of megabecks of radioactivity you have drops over time. So typically you have about half an hour to perform this whole production process. So what happens after you've produced the radio tracer? Well, you need to carry out quality control tests. Um, this section is applicable to both radio tracers made in a pet center, as Maite described, so ones that originated from a cyclotron, um, and also ones that have been made in a radio pharmacy where uh, the radioisotope uh, originated from a generator. Um, so QC tests that need to be completed are specific to that radio tracer. Um, and these are defined in the pharmacopoeia monograph, or if it's already got marketing authorization in the summary of product characteristics for that uh, specific product. You can see a zoom in of uh, some of the instructions there. Um, so I'm gonna take you through some example tests. Um, so as I said, not every single test will be needed to be done for every single radio tracer, but it just gives you a feel for the type of test that might um, happen. And if you hear that one of the tests has passed or failed, you'll have an idea about what that, what that um, means and how we could improve that in the future. So um, one of the first things we want to do is we want to measure how much radioactivity we've got. Um, and we can do this using a machine here called a cap and tech or a dose um, reader. Um, you measure the radioactivity level, check that you've got enough for all the patients that you want to use the radio tracer for. Um, you also need to make sure that you've definitely got the right radioactive isotope um, and somehow you didn't incorporate any radioactive impurities. Um, and this can be done by checking that the half-life you expect for the radio tracer is the half-life that you measure or checking all of the emissions um, from the QC sample. So checking that it's decaying in the way you would expect for the products that you wanted. Um, also, um, we need to actually visually inspect the vial that before we send it out to be administered. Um, make sure there's no cracks, that the solution's the right color, that it's the right volume. Um, and we also need to check that the label is correct. Um, we also need to check that no bacteria is present in the sample. Um, and we do this by adding a small sample of the radio tracer we produced to a batch of broth um, and then waiting to see if bacteria grows. Um, this testing actually takes two weeks to provide results. Um, so it actually can't be done before administration to the patient. So instead we have to show compliance through validation and historical track record. And Maite is going to talk about the specifics of these type of tests that have to be done um, after administration to the patient. We get the results after administration to the patient in her next talk. Um, so we can, oh sorry, we can actually test um, for some um, types of sterility before administration and endotoxin tests are one of the ways that we can do this. So endotoxins are found in gram negative bacteria and they are toxic um, and so we need to check that they are not present in any radio traces we produce. We can do this with a machine and a cartridge um, as shown in these pictures um, and you get a readout to show that it's passed. Uh, it's also important to check things like the pH is, is correct, um, and this can be done with things like pH paper. Um, one of the most important tests is to check that you've actually made the product that you were expecting, um, and this can be done um, using something called radio TLC. Um, so this checks that you have bound all of the radioactive metal um, into the desired radio tracer. Um, in this example, you basically put a bit of radio tracer onto a special paper, strip of special paper, and then you put it into a tube containing a small amount of solution. This solution moves up the paper, um, and hopefully the radio tracer will move up the paper if it's also been, um, if it's been made correctly. And if it hasn't 
uh, been made correctly, it will remain at the baseline. Um, and then because you can't see the radiation with your eyes, you have to use a detector um, to provide you with a graph of where the radio tracer is located on that strip of paper. And this is the machine that we use for that. Um, and you get a graph that looks something like this. Um, and you can measure the ratios of the different, um, the different products on the, on the graph. Um, a similar test that you can use to check for purity is radio HPLC. Um, this is basically trying to do the same thing, but it's able to distinguish between more compounds at one time. So it gives you more information than your ITLC can. Um, so the way that this works is that you inject the radio tracer into the system and it travels to a column. And different compounds take different amounts of time to be released from a column. And so this is how they're separated from one another. Um, once the radio tracer leaves the column and goes through the detectors um, and then into waste, uh, you get a graph showing you at what time the radio tracer came off the column. And you can check that every time you do the synthesis, it, you get the same graph. Um, and you can also check that this agrees with a known standard as well. So you're expecting to get nice graphs that correspond to your standard and your uh, radio tracer. Um, another test that we might need to do is filter integrity. Um, and this machine is used to check for any filters that might be used in the process um, in order to sterile filter the radio tracer and remove any possible bacteria were actually working at the time that they were used and that they didn't have any leaks. Um, and this basically confirms that the product is sterile. So this is the, a range of different uh, tests that might need to be done on a radio tracer. Um, and again, it is super important to do these QC tests quickly and effectively. You typically have about half an hour to perform all of these tests um, and you need to do that as soon as it comes out of production. So the next step is quality assurance, checking that all of the steps of production in QC have been done correctly. Um, all the tests have passed, everything was in date, everything was labeled correctly. Um, and so you're gonna look through the production report and the QC report, and then um, put together a release document. So for non-clinical trial radio tracers, this is, can be done by any member of the QA team. But again, specifically for IMPs, so for investigational medicinal products of clinical trials, it has to be a QP uh, that signs that release document. Um, the other thing that, um, the other document that the QA release might also cover is the transport documents as well. Um, they're likely to be responsible for checking these um, as um, there's lots of regulations around transport as well. But as I said, again, it's very important that this part of the process um, happens in a timely manner. So it's really important that you ensure that the QA or the QP is, avail is available at the required time to sign off the radio tracer. It's particularly important for QPs because nobody can um, substitute in for them. And QPs are often based across many sites. So you need to ensure that they're available at the required time uh, at the required site for the radio tracer manufacturing when you're doing a clinical trial. So um, you then put the radio tracer into a case ready for transport into a patient, uh, transport to a patient. Um, and this might be within the hospital or it might be at another site. So as I said, it's important to check everything's labeled correctly and you're complying with all the transport regulations. So again, this is very really important um, to be done on time and efficiently. You want to ensure the courier is going to arrive on time and take the product directly to the site, as any delays could mean the radio tracer can't be administered to the patient. So um, if everything goes well, then the tracer will get from production to the patient in about an hour. Um, and this requires a lot of teamwork and coordination. But unfortunately, sometimes things don't go as planned. So I'm just going to talk to you about, unfortunately, talk to you about failures now. So sometimes radio 
tracer production can fail. Um, such failures actually happen in the manufacture of any GMP product, but um, if you were talking about a non-radioactive drug, um, you tend to have a much longer expiry, um, and so you can store up a stock uh, of product, um, which means that if you're doing a clinical trial or if you're working in the hospital, you're rarely going to see the impact of these production failures because there's enough stock to cover. Um, however, when we're talking about radio traces, these have a really short half-life, um, which means that they've got a really short expiry time from being made. And so they're basically made on demand for a patient. And so, of course, if um, a failure happens, um, then it's going to have more impact. So a failure might be uh, detected at any part of uh, the process that I've described. It could be during production, it could be QC or QA. Um, there could also be a problem in transport. Um, and if the product isn't fit for purpose, then it wouldn't be released for administration to the patient. So the QA or the QP uh, wouldn't be able to sign it off to say, yes, you can go ahead and administer. Um, it's likely that if a failure does occur, a patient will have to be um, rescheduled and um, this is going to be covered by Edith in her talk how um, how best to think about rescheduling patients and the implications if you're doing uh, different types of studies um, and so I just wanted to explain why it's not often possible to repeat the synthesis on the same day um, so say the um, radio tracer failed at, at 10 a.m sometimes it's not possible to repeat it in the afternoon. Um, and this is because of the setup and manufacturing time within the radio pharmacy. It's also due to the um, staffing hours. I'm gonna to talk to you about that on my next slide. Um, and also just kind of physical things in that the generators I've explained um, about earlier in my talk, it takes about two to six hours to regenerate enough um, technetium 99M or gallium 68 in order to be able to make another batch for a patient. So you kind of got to wait that period of time anyway before you can even have a chance of making it again correctly. Um, if the um, radio trace is made from a cyclotron um, produced radioisotope, then you need to ensure that there is time on the cyclotron in order to produce that. Um, and also you need to make sure that by the time you've uh, made uh, the product again, that there's actually um, enough time left in the day to image the patient. So um, just to give you a little bit more insight into why it might be hard to repeat a production run on the same day, or why you would need to give a, a radio pharmacy appropriate notice if you decided you have to change when a radio tracer needs to be produced, I wanted to give you an overview of a day in the radio pharmacy. Um, so as you can see, the start time is very early. Staff in the radio pharmacy don't work nine to five, um, but typically six till two. Um, and this of course is gonna impact on when you might be able to talk to a member of radio pharmacy staff um, and also how far in advance changes need to be made. Um, so normally the technetium 99M production, which is the bulk of the radio pharmaceuticals that a radio pharmacy tends to produce, uh, is gonna happen early in the morning so that radio traces can be available um, and sent to nuclear medicine departments so that um, patients can start to be administered and then scanned from 9am onwards. Um, due to the shorter half-life of gallium-68, Gallium-68 radio traces tend to be made later in the morning um, and it is most likely that it's going to be that Gallium-68 slot which is the one that will change if you need to do additional runs for a clinical study or clinical trial. Um, so you can imagine if you're already doing it much later in the working day, then if it goes wrong, you're not going to have enough time to reschedule it with all the staff that you need. And as I said, you need all members of those three different teams, the production team, the QC team and the QA team to be available to do it. Um, so I just really wanted to give you um, that overview of uh, what it's like when people are working in the radio pharmacy. Um, 
So I hope that this talk has provided you with uh, insight into the processes that go on in the radio pharmacy in order to produce radio tracers. Um, and I thought it'd be nice to end with this short video, which recaps the processes that um, I've discussed with you. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to hear the music that goes along with it too. So yeah, thank you very much for listening and I'll hand over uh, to Elizabeth.